CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Soldiers fret and worry about the bullet that has their number on it. But it doesn't bother the old soldiers at all. They can feel fatalistic about and resign to the bullet that has their number. The one that really worries them is the bullet that's labeled to whom it may concern. Don't come near me. Rebecca, what are you saying? Keep away. But I love you. Leave here. No. But we're going to get married. Go away before I cause something terrible to happen. Oh, darling, how can you cause something terrible? Believe me, it will be horrible. A fire. Rebecca. A flood. What do you say? Earthquake. Listen. Listen. mystery drama, To Whom It May Concern, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan, and stars Marion Feldes and Ian Martin. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Something beautiful and vital has gone out of our lives. The ability to just sit back and relax. The difference between us and the generations that preceded ours is that we have learned how to save time, whereas they knew how to enjoy it. They had time, time for everything. And this is the story of a man who lived back then when there was time, just before World War I. Come with me now to the New York Club of Dr. Adams Mandeville, a place of fine old wine, mellow cigars, gleaming crystal, and easy conversation on a May evening in the year 1915. Uh, hello there, Dr. Mandeville. Oh, good evening, Mr. Forbes. Mind if I join you? No, please. We see so little of you here at the club these days. And I'm afraid you shall see even less. I'm off to London. London? Oh, you can't be serious. The war. Well, we're not at all. Uh, not yet. Nor do I think we ever will be. And in any event, I must go to London. May I ask why? Well, we're having the International Conference on Psychiatry. It's uh, towering into the mind. Tricky business, No. Oh, yeah? He does it, uh, <clears throat> what is that? Can it, can it help your patients? Well, I don't know how much it helps my patients, but I know it's helped me. Help you? Well, how? Let me put it this way. It's going to help me. It's going to save my life. How can you tell if it's going to save your life? Do you believe in the angel of death? The, uh, <clears throat> angel of death? Yes. Yeah. Well, I uh, suppose, uh, figuratively speaking, in a way, uh, we might assume... That was the uh, first question she asked me when she entered my office. She? Mrs. Rebecca Orne, a widow, most beautiful woman. Well, when I say woman, I mean... I mean a woman of almost 40, when the fair sex are in the glorious August of their beauty, a fully realized woman. Uh, well, I must say... This doesn't sound like a doctor speaking. Well, doctors are also men. It was a month ago. She made an appointment to see me on the telephone, and when she sat down in my office, her very first question... Dr. Mandela, do you believe there is an angel of death? Why? Why do you ask? I understand you are one of those new doctors that's the mind... The angel of death, is he real or is he a figment, a creation of my own? Mrs. Owen, I know of no scientific evidence that can account for the existence of an angel of death or of life, or of any angel for that matter. Well, 
there is anyone else such evidence except perhaps myself. And what is your evidence, may I ask? An awareness of his presence. Uh-huh. What sort of awareness? The feeling that I'm not alone. Awareness? Feeling. But is there anything tangible? It's tangible enough to me. Well, the word tangible literally means something that can be touched. I know. And I feel his touch. Where? Oh. Uh, this may sound indelicate. I feel his touch. <clears throat> All over my body. Yes? It feels as if I were suddenly chilled by an icy wind. And my skin seems to burn. It sounds contradictory, I know. Ice and fire. No, no, no. Please continue, Mrs. Owens. And I feel as if my hand is being taken. Taken? Taken in someone's grasp. You feel a hand. The fingers of a hand close on mine. And you see? No one. Nothing. But you feel these fingers? Yes. And how do they feel to the touch? Well, again, fire and ice. <laughs> Burning fire and cold, cold ice. I see coldness of death. And then what happened? The fingers of the hand, the hand that has closed over mine, it, it seems to hold me in its firm grasp and it begins to pull me. I, I cannot, I have no will to resist. And then? And then the ice becomes warmer and the fire becomes cooler and the fingers of the hand that is holding mine seem to slacken their grip and slip away from it. And suddenly I feel his presence no longer. He's gone. You, uh... You're quite sure of all this. Oh, yes. It's exactly the same way. Each time. Oh, then this has happened several times. Oh, yes. How many? Oh, innumerable. Uh, I have a theory. Would you like to hear it? Oh, yes, please. He wants me. You have to, you might say, if he exists, he wants all of us. When our time comes. But I think my time has already come. Uh, I'm afraid I don't understand. And that he was unable to take me at that time. And since I escaped him, he must keep after me. And it becomes more and more difficult for him each time. And so he tries harder and harder. <laughs> and, and yes, Mrs. Owen. <laughs> I've never been able to say so much to any doctor. Most of them would give me pills for my nerves long, long before I could get this far. Well, I promise to hear you out. Well, it's about all. Except that they keep getting worse and worse. What keeps getting worse and worse? A disaster. So many people die. And it's because of me. He doesn't really want them. He wants me. And the reason they die is because they just uh, happen to be there. Yes. Well, why do you say yes? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you really understand what I'm saying? Mrs. Owen, did you have a happy childhood? Why do you ask? Oh, well, in psychiatry, we begin with the child. Well, that makes sense. Yes. Well, it all began with my childhood. That was when he first came for me. When who came for you? Well, who have we been talking about? The angel. Yes. Oh, yes, of course. And, and that's when I felt his grasp for the first time. It happened when I was five years old. We were living in Johnstown, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Johnstown, Pennsylvania? That name seems familiar. I'll never forget. 
I was in the kitchen of our house. We had a farm, a big farm, about 500 acres. And I remember there was an argument. Mama and Papa were having a fight. It was about the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. These were the very wealthy men who owned the property where the dam was located. Now, Mama, be reasonable. Be reasonable? Have you lost your mind? No, I haven't lost my mind. What's more, it's a found hundred dollars. Well, I don't want that money. Now, you post the no-hunting signs this year like every other year. Mama, Mama, it, it's just for ten days, and the only ones who'll be allowed to hunt are members of the club. Look, I won't have people tramping all up and down the property, firing off guns every which way. Mama, these are all millionaires, rich men. They have a lot of respect for private property. And they know how to hunt very good, too. Well, don't they have all that property of their own around the dam? Wait, you know that over by the South 40 is where all the deer trails cross? Here's another thing. I'm against killing poor, dumb animals. Who so am I? But for a hundred dollars... Now, what about Rebecca? Uh, Rebecca? She goes running around the woods all the time. There was all them hunters shooting away. I... Well, so, for the next ten days, you got to keep her in the house. How can I keep the child cooped up all day? For a hundred dollars, you better find a way to do it. Although she laid down the law in no uncertain terms, I was a restless child filled with unlimited energy. I couldn't sit still. I always wanted to be where I wasn't. And so, one afternoon, when Mama stretched out for her nap, I was just out the door, running through the woods, happy the way only a child can be, and I heard a voice suddenly shout, Look out, Hunt! But the voice was too late. There was a noise and a flash. Don't blow against my chest. That was the first time I felt the icy cold and burning hot fingers close about my hand and the gentle pull that urged me forward. And I heard a voice. Hey, good Lord, Andy, you killed her. Look at the blood. The bullet went right through her chest, through her heart. Oh, she must be dead. <laughs> I was dead. At least I thought I was dead. I should have been dead. The angel of death had come for me. But suddenly, the fingers that grasped my hand loosened their grip. The ice became warm. The fire cool. And I just slipped away from him. Or he from me. And I was free. You, uh, were shot through the heart? Yes. Could the bullet have missed? No. But surely... And the doctors came from miles around. The best doctors the club saw to that. They were amazed. Well, how did they account for it? They didn't. Those doctors couldn't. They said perhaps the bullet broke as it hit my chest and just a small piece of it penetrated my heart. Perhaps the tissue was able to repair itself. But really, they were only guessing. I was shot through the heart. That much is certain. And you lived. That much is obvious. I lived through other things, too. I was bitten by a copperhead a year or two later. Well, people do survive snake bites. Oh, that'll snake bite sometimes. But very few folks are ever actually bitten by copperheads. And those that are... You're very lucky. Very imaginative. You know, you're a charming lady, Mrs. Holmes. May I ask why you have never remarried? Because I'm... Right. Of marriage? I believe I told you. The angel of death is so intent on capturing me that those around me are always in danger. Now, you're sitting here in my office. Am I in danger now? Yes, Doctor. How? I don't know. The, the, the building might. It's not likely. It's a new building constructed of steel and stone. There might be an earthquake. There never have been any here in the east. Or a flood. Well, hardly. Well, there was a flood once. That's like 26 years ago. When I told you I came from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, you said the name seemed familiar. Do you remember why now? 
Yes, of course. The flood, the famous flood. The Johnstown flood. Were you there at the time? Yes. And and you lived through it? Yes, I lived through it. Unfortunately. Now, why do you say unfortunately? Because it wasn't fair that I should survive. I really deserve to die. I caused the flood, Doctor. I'm the one to blame for the Johnstown flood. The Johnstown flood, May 31st, 1889. The dam across the Connemore River had become obsolete and inadequate. During April and May, 41 inches of rain and snow increased the pressures to the breaking point, and a tidal wave of destruction swept through the valley, killing more than 2,000 people. This is the historical fact. Now, if Mrs. Rebecca Owens has other information, we owe her the courtesy of a hearing in Act Two. Here we are at the very beginning of May, 1915. Remember that date. It will be significant. In the exclusive New York club of Dr. Adams Mandeville, Dr. Mandeville is having a very serious conversation with an old friend, Mr. Hector Forbes, the renowned anthropologist. Mr. Forbes is having difficulty believing what Dr. Mandeville is telling him. Hey, my dear Mandeville, I remember the Johnstown flood. There are people who can be held responsible. But surely your patient is uh, Mrs. Rebecca Owen. Yeah. Now, she couldn't be one of them. But according to her story... She mentions the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. Now, it was a group of millionaires who had bought the land from the state. The dam was located on their property. They refused to spend money for any repairs, and the people of Johnstown didn't believe that there was any real danger either. So there's blame enough and to spare for everyone. And yet, when she talks, you can believe anything she tells you. You can believe anything she says. <laughs> you uh, haven't fallen for this lady, have you? As a matter of fact, uh, well, uh, I'll get to that. I tell you this story because I have a very important question I want to ask you. Why are we? Oh, you'll have to hear the rest of the story. Oh, yes, yes. Especially why she thinks she's to blame for the Johnstown flood. That's what I asked her. The flood was on my account. But why? It was the only way the angel of death could get me. A bullet failed. The bite of a poisonous snake failed. And here was a way that couldn't fail. Or so it seemed. Oh, poor Phil. Philip Dumont, my first bow. I was 15 and I was in love. The way you can be in love when you're 15. We were out walking. It was the last day of May. Beautiful afternoon. What time is it, Phil? Uh, ten minutes after four. Why? I would like this moment to last forever. This is the supreme moment. This is the happiest moment of my life. Of mine, too. Everything's so perfect. What's that? Uh, thunder, most likely. Thunder doesn't sound like that. Oh, sure it does. No, it doesn't. You hear a loud peal of thunder, and then it fades, and then you hear another. It's getting louder. Rebecca, look! No! No! It's a wave! It's water! It's high as a house! It's high as a It's coming at us! Run, Phil, run! Run, run! Run, run! Run, run! Run, run! Run, run! Nothing could live that stood in its path. 
but somehow I live. I don't know why. I don't know how. I was surrounded by hundreds of the dead. But I survived. Once again, the fire became cold and the ice warm. And his fingers fell away. Why? I, um, I don't know. Poor Phil. He was with me. And more than 2,000 of us. Was it my fault? Oh, of course not. And how do you explain the fire? The fire? The fire in Chicago. That was only 12 years ago. That dreadful conflagration in the Iroquois theater. Oh, yes, of course I remember that. He moved to Chicago. Mama and Papa had survived the flood only because they'd gone to Pittsburgh to visit my grandmother. So there was nothing left for us in Johnstown, and Papa was offered a job at Chicago. It didn't matter to me. After the flood, I was like one in a dream. I just stayed in the house, in my room. I went nowhere. I saw no one. Oh, Papa, you must do something about that girl. Me? Well, she won't listen to me. Take her to a doctor. Hasn't she seen enough doctors? Well, what do you want? She'll be 28 years old. Uh, maybe 30. That's even worse. She'll spend the rest of her life this way, an old maid. Uh, some girls, they don't get married. It's, it's their fate. Well, it's not going to be her fate. You have to fight it. Get your coat and hat, young lady. You can't shut out the world forever. We're going to the theater. I don't want to. You know why? Because it's medicine. The pills you get from the doctors don't help. So I know another kind of doctor. His name is Eddie Foy. And his cure is a good laugh. But I'm, I'm not in the mood. I... You're going to turn down a chance to see Eddie Foy and Mr. Bluebeard? <laughs> you know how hard it was to get tickets? Please, Papa, I... No, 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 no. Up, up, out. Oh. He was right. The minute I stepped into that theater, a great weight seemed to disappear from my heart. I felt useful and carefree. The music, the dances, the jokes. I was laughing and applauding, and then suddenly... In the very midst of it, at the very height of it, I felt the fingers of my arms, the icy fingers, the burning fingers. And I said, no, what do you want with me now? What will you do to me here? Please. And then I heard the most dreadful cry in the world in the theater. Fire! 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 For almost a second, there was a deathly stillness, and then there was a panic. More than 2,000 of well-dressed, civilized people were transformed into raging, mindless, stampeding animals. And when it was over, finally, almost 600 were dead. Yes, I read about it. The fire actually did very little damage, I recall. Most people were trampled to death. Papa died to save me. He saw we couldn't make it to the exit, and so he protected me with his body. I'm sorry. Papa left the world, but I came back to it. Mama became ill, and it was up to me to support us. I learned how to use a typewriter and to write in shorthand. And soon I secured a position as a secretary to a Mr. Walter Owen, who was middle-aged, very proper, but kind, most generous employer. Mama became better, but she was quite sad. I'll have some soup now. Mama, you're crying. No, no, I'm not. Rebecca, I... 
I do want you to have a life of your own. I'm content. But you'll never have a husband. You'll never have children. I don't want anybody close to me. Rebecca, that's not natural. Please, let's not talk about it. But a husband and children, they would make you happy. Yes, yeah, Mom. Very happy. But I couldn't make them happy. Why not? Because they died. They die young before their time. What are you saying? Nothing. I don't want to talk about it anymore. We plan our lives. But it isn't we who decide our destiny. The ordinary give and take of daily living wears us, shapes us, changes us. And we may not even be aware of it. One morning, Mr. Owen asked me to come into his private office. Miss Randolph? You have been my secretary for five years now. Yes, sir. I have never seen a more devoted, conscientious, and efficient person. Thank you, sir. I, I find, Miss Randolph, that I would be lost without you. You are a treasure. Oh, really, Mr. Owen? No, 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 no. A treasure is something that a man must guard securely. If uh, you were a stock or a bond or a bill or a jewel, I, I would shut you up in a vault. Unless you be lost or stolen. I'm not sure I understand. Miss Randolph, will you marry me? Marry? Yes. We could be quite happy together. Oh, but Mr. Owen, I, 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 I'm not in love with you. Oh, well, no, no, we are not children. Love to us is not a sudden intoxicating adventure. We can marry without it. Marry without love? Yes. Marry without love at first. Uh, marry because we respect, admire, and need each other. Now, we are both lonely people. I know in my heart that love will come to us. All day at the office, he would ask me to marry him. He enlisted Mama's help, and then all night at home, it was more of the same. Oh, he's handsome, kind, intelligent. Oh, he's devoted to you. And he's rich. Mama, I will not marry him. But why? I could never explain it to you. I will not marry him. And that is my last word. But it wasn't. Little by little, in so many subtle and gradual ways, the pressure, the constant pressure, told on me. And suddenly, before I knew it, I was in his arms saying, Yes. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Let's go. And so we were married. It was the event of the social season of 1911. I knew Walter was rich, but I didn't know how rich. He had as much money, as much influence, as much power as the biggest of them. The Carnegies, the Morgans, the Fricks, the Mellons. They were all there at my wedding. Mr. Andrew Carnegie himself took my hand and wished me well. Kindly looking man. And suddenly, I knew I had seen him before. I heard a voice. The same voice I had heard 38 years before when I was a little girl on my father's farm in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Look out, Andy! Look out! Oh, good Lord, Andy, you killed her! The South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. The Millionaire's Club. All these great men were members of that club. And they might have been out hunting the day the dam burst when I was five years old. Andy, the man who had evoked the warning. The man who had accidentally fired the shot. And could he have been Andrew Carnegie? I looked into his eyes. I couldn't tell. My dearest, may I present Mr. Andrew Carnegie? I'm honored, Mr. Carnegie. Oh, such a sweet lass, Walter. She's a treasure? Yes, I think so. Hey, do you know, dear Mrs. Owen, it seems to me you look familiar. Do I, sir? Yeah, I have seen you before. Or is it perhaps an old man's reverie? Eh, hey, where can you... Be happy, both of you. No, be happy. Yes, we have met before. 
on my father's land in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, when I was a little farm girl. But somehow that seemed out of place. And as I looked at Mr. Carnegie and at Walter and at all the other giants, I realized I was no longer afraid of anything. I belonged to one of these men. We went to Europe on our honeymoon. We saw palaces in Italy and castles in Spain. We walked in Vienna, marveled at the Louvre. And finally, I decided to come home. I was so happy. Yes, I can imagine. I was happy, but I was also apprehensive. What? When I was never really able to free myself completely of my fear. So I dreaded the trip home. Darling, honey, I know how you feel, but it... But what, Walter? But this is a brand new ship. A ship the like of which has never been seen. It's a floating palace. But still, if anything... Most important. They say she's constructed on a completely new principle. There's incontrovertible scientific proof that she is unthinkable. Oh, Walter. She leaves on Friday on her maiden voyage to New York, and I've already booked passage for her. Oh, how exciting. What's her name? The Titanic. <laughs> On April 15th, 1912, a minute before midnight, the Titanic struck a killer iceberg some 2,000 miles from New York with a loss of some 1,500 lives. Among the casualties... Oh, no, I shall have to stop this. This business of anticipating the story. We still have a third act. Dr. Adams Mandeville, a New York psychiatrist, is at his club talking with his friend Hector Ford. The subject of the discussion is, as you know, his patient, a woman named Mrs. Owen. And what can we say about Mrs. Owen other than she must be the victim of the most extraordinary string of coincidences in history? Uh, are we perhaps not heard in some uh, psychic area? Is it possible she is not a human being? No, she's human, completely human. Human and... and lovely. She, uh, continued to see me over a several-week period. And each time I saw her, I fell more and more deeply in love. Rebecca, darling. Oh, oh please, please, doctor. <laughs> can't call a man doctor after he calls you darling. I must leave you and never return again. Why? Oh, don't you know why? Oh, it isn't true. Everything you've been telling me about the the angel of death. How can you say that? I felt him. I felt his touch. No, darling. You can't convince me. I let Paul Walter convince me, and he's dead today. Walter would have died in any event. He died because the angel of death came from me. There is no such being. Oh, you say that to me. To me. I'm 41 years old. And you don't look a day over 25. Be serious. And five times in my life, I have felt his presence in my body. Five times. I have felt his hand on my arm. Five times he's held me in his grasp. Yes, yes, I know you said that. And the last time. The last time was the worst time of all. He was so determined to have me, he destroyed the greatest ship in the world to get me. Oh, I can hear the music. It was such a gay, wonderful party. I was dancing with Walter. Happy darling? Oh, yes. Yes. See, I told you, everything would be all right. I don't know if it's you or the ship, but I feel so safe, so secure. It's both of us, darling. Nothing but happy and wonderful thoughts from now on. Let me get you a glass of champagne. He walked to the refreshment table and I lost sight of it in the crowd. And, and I... I never saw him again. Because at that moment, I felt the fingers, the icy fingers of the angel. The angel of death. And I screamed. Everyone turned to look at me. Was I mad? 
And then, then there was the most terrible, grinding roar as if some monstrous animal had ripped the entire bottom out of the boat. The next thing I remember, I was on board the rescue ship, Carpathia. But 1,500 of us had died. And Walter... And Walter had perished. And now you tell me it isn't my fault. Yes. How? All the evidence... All the evidence proves nothing. Oh, listen to me, my darling. Let me tell you what this is. It's the law of average. Oh, that's not good enough. The touch of the angel of death. It was real. Well, of course it was real. Then you agree. It was real to you. Oh, my darling Rebecca, we're only now beginning to understand the mind to comprehend its fantastic complexity. Then why was it real? Because... Because you wanted to be punished. Punished for what? For disobeying your mother. When? That day when you were told not to go into the woods. You remember that day? That day when you were five years old and your mother took you aside and... What was it she said to you over and over again? She... She said, you are not to go into the woods. You are not to leave the house. If you disobey, you will be punished. Severely punished. 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 That's right. Punished. 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 But you did disobey, didn't you? And Rebecca, you were not punished. And then, because you were almost killed, you were rewarded. You were fussed over and coddled and spoiled. And all the time you knew that you were to blame. You remember the face of the man who shot you. You could see his agony and his anger. Oh, no, 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 no. This is necessary, dear. You look for death. You seek him out. You court him. You spin fantasies about him. Oh, darling, there is no angel of death except in romantic mystery. But I... Face it. The whole world will be changed. Oh, I never looked at it that way. Oh, my darling. We'll, we'll go to England on our honeymoon. I'd like you to meet Mama. Oh, but of course. Could you leave now? I bought Mama a house in Austin, up on the Hudson River. Oh, let's tell her today. Well, certainly. Let's see, it's uh, 10.30 now. I have some hospital calls to make it 11, so... Uh, I should be free by noon. We can get the train at one o'clock. Meet me on board. I'll be sitting in the last passenger coach. One o'clock on the opening train, the last coach. Yes. It's the only one that isn't a smoker. That was two weeks ago, Forbes. Well, evidently you will make the trip in good shape. I see you're here and none the worse. Hmm. You don't know what happened two weeks ago on the railroad. You see, I was delayed at the hospital, and when I arrived at the station, the train had already pulled out. Well, uh, you missed it, Jess. Yes, and the train had traveled some 25 miles to a place called Tarrytown when... when there was an accident. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Don't, don't tell me. Yes, some switching instructions had gone wrong, and an express train plunged into the rear of the Austin local. The rear car it was completely demolished. There were five passengers, four were killed immediately. But the fifth, Rebecca, suffered only from shock and a very few superficial bruises. He had death. He is real. He came to me again. He came looking for me aboard that train. He came for me. I felt his hand, his fingers. The fire, the ice. You mustn't make fun of me. What I say is true. Of course it's true. Don't humor me. It is true. Do you mean that? Yes. And the angel of death exists. I'm very much afraid he does. It's over. It must be over between us. 
I love you and I want to marry you. You must never see me again. I don't want you to die because of me. And I don't want to live without you. Oh, darling. You're a doctor. Be sensible. Oh, I'm in love, so that's impossible. Face reality. Reality is that I love you. Reality is that if you had been with me on that train... You will be dead now. Ah, oh, but I wasn't with you. And next time we won't be so... I wasn't with you on the train. That's it. That's how to do it. No, it won't Yes, work. yes, it's how to reduce the odds. That's how to fight the old boy. That's how to put him in his place. But I still... We can't... must never travel together. We must never board the same boat, the same train. We must never go to crowded places where, where disasters can strike. Theaters, restaurants, concerts. But I never go anyhow. But you... Can't shut yourself away. Rebecca, I don't need crowds. I only need you. So we shall live by ourselves, quietly, carefully, in safety. You see? I see now. And if he comes for me again, let him come for me alone. To a house that will be stone, so it can't burn. Or steel. And then it can't fall apart. Away from rivers and floods. Away from forests and fires. Now, now. Now will you marry me, darling? Yes. Yes. Rebecca and I were married the day before yesterday. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> Uh, well, how does it happen you're not off on your honeymoon? Oh, we're going to London, where we shall also take in the conference. I'm leaving tomorrow morning. Well, you're off on a honeymoon, and you say I'm leaving? Well, naturally. Separate ships. It's the only way we can travel. Uh, oh, yes, of course, of course. Rebecca sailed this morning on the Imperia, and I had to look around for something at the last moment. Yes, well, on such short notice, you'd be lucky to find a berth on a tramp steamer. <laughs> oh, I did considerably better than that. There was a last-minute cancellation, and I was able to get a cabin on what many people consider the most comfortable ocean liner afloat. Oh, really? Which one is that? The Lusitania. The Lusitania. On May 7th, 1915, at approximately 2 p.m., the German killer submarine, the U-20 fired its torpedoes into the Cunard liner Lusitania. The ship blew up and sank almost immediately. About 2,000 people lost their lives. Among them, an American physician, Dr. Adams Mandeville of New York City. I shall return in just a few moments. <laughs> The old soldiers, as we told you in the beginning, are worried mostly about the bullet marked to whom it may concern. That's because they know something few of us pause to consider. They realize how unpredictable is fate, how random is chance, how impersonal is providence, how hard it is to live and how easy to die. And if life perplexes and puzzles you, take comfort. No one has been able to figure it out yet. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Ian Martin, Bryna Rayburn, Bob Dryden, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time...